Corey Sherman North, who is curator at the Burgersons and Memorial Gallery in Lindsburg. She also acts as curator for the Land Institute's International Prairie Festival in Salina, Kansas. Sherman North earned her master's degree in art history from the University of Kansas. She has been an active board member for the Kansas Museums Association, advocating for museums on the stage at the state level and national level. That annual, their annual meeting happens in a few days and she's headed that direction and that's in Hayes this year. Sherman North is a frequent contributor to the American Art Review magazine and is the author of numerous publications, can't name them all, including the 2021 biography, Berger Sanzane Celebrating the Vision, and the exhibition catalogs, B.J. O. Nordfeldt in Kansas from 2022, and Art for All, The Swedish Experience in Mid-America, that's 2019. So thank you, Corey. Thank you. Alrighty, well, I get the pleasure of introducing you all to uh, the history of uh, Birger Sanzane and his effect on uh, the state of Kansas art and culture. And as Liz pointed out, um, Kansas really has a unique story with all the public oriented art in schools and libraries and colleges and anywhere that regular people were. Um, and so our story of San Zane and his effect on the art of Kansas uh, really begins in Sweden. And this is why Kansas is unique, is because the the history of a democratic approach to art really starts here. Uh, San Zane was born in Blitzberia, which is uh, purple down at the bottom of the uh, country there. And uh, our hero was born 1871 to a pastor and um, family of three boys, Sanzane's in the center, little Moppet with the curly blonde hair. And he was so fortunate. His family was just, um, father was a pastor, but he was also a poet and a musician. And his mother was an artist and uh, was very proficient in the French language. And so they brought their boys up to speak multiple languages in the home to um, have their own watercolor paintings and um, music every day. Uh, so really kind of a Renaissance family and just in a, a typical little Swedish little town. Sanzane was sent off to a cathedral school, Skora, and um, was able to take private art lessons there. So he was, uh, started at a very young age being interested in arts. Um, along with music. So uh, he went off to college, uh, University of Lund, for one semester, and he studied art and aesthetics and French and philosophy, along with botany. Um, and then he came home and said, Mom, Dad, you know, I think I really want to be an artist. And they said, okay, uh, <laughs> go ahead and give it a try. We'll support you. Uh, so at that time, uh, the only place in the entire country that you could study art was at the Royal Academy. Um, it had been in existence for more than 100 years at that point, and you'll notice the Royal Academy attachment, it was extremely elite. You could get in if you knew somebody, you know, if you had some status, um, or uh, what Sanzane did is he arrived in Stockholm in 1891 and he was not invited to enroll right away he did not have status uh, he did not know anyone on the staff and uh, instead they had a program where um, every week hopefuls could go to the school and draw do drawings and then they'd be rated and then eventually you know the high ratings might be invited to enroll. Well, Sanzane was never really invited to enroll um, that, that whole year. He was taking private lessons and getting to know people in Stockholm, going to 
um, anything that he could participate in. But amazingly, um, in October of 1891, with some of the uh, other young whippersnappers that he had been meeting around town, uh, the very uh, radical modern artist Andrew Sorn and his compatriots, who had begun the Artist League, uh, opened free art studio classes in October of that year. And San Zane was in the first class along with some of these fellows. Um, and to really get to this point, now we're gonna have to go back in history uh, 10 years to tell you the story of how that happened. Here we've got Ander Zorn, arguably one of Sweden's most famous artists nowadays. Back in 1881, he was in the uh, Royal Academy. Uh, but he was a, a radical, thinking, really modernist-oriented young man, and the Royal Academy was not suiting him very well at all. So he said, well, I'm leaving. And uh, he went on to uh, do amazing art everywhere. Um, you can see this watercolor he was proficient in oils. He was um, very democratic. He did oil paintings for very famous people, uh, King of Sweden, a uh, couple American presidents. But he was also very interested in getting art to everyone, art for all. Uh, you see his print, his etching that matches you know, the one-off painting, and Zorn tried to do etchings as much as he did paintings, because of course, prints, you can get out, you know, a hundred uh, people for very little money. And so he was very instrumental in starting um, Sweden's Association for the Graphic Arts that would uh, commission contemporary artists to make a print, you know, several, a couple artists several times a year, and that was with in conjunction with the museum. Um, and I love the story behind this particular painting. Uh, Zorn was also very known for his insistence on getting away from the history painting, the religious stuff, you know, real people in real Swedish landscape. That was what art was all about. And here, one summer, he borrowed a carpenter's son to go with some of his models. <laughs> And he said, you know, we returned him in better shape than we borrowed him. <laughs> so uh, Zorn was just insistent on uh, this modern approach to art and everyone participating. And there were some other artists of his time, and these are all a couple of people, Swedish artists in the um, what we now call the Swedish National Romantics. And they were all interested in... Um, real people, real places, real Swedish. Uh, Richard Berry is another one of San Zane's mentors that was in the Artists League. Um, here's one of his famous works of that's uh, real people in a real place, recognizable. She was an opera singer at the time. Um, and the fellow, uh, fellow standing there is actually uh, Prince. He was a, a royal descent, but he was also a modern artist himself, Prince Eugen. Um, through another artist, uh, Per Hasselberg was mostly a sculptor. And then many of you will have heard of Carl Larson, uh, who did a lot of domestic scenes with his own family, you know, real, real people, real places. Well, all these artists in the early 1880s, along with Zorn, uh, you know, they were not happy with the Royal Academy and the elitist training that you'd get, very traditional. Um, whereas in Paris, you know, the last decade had seen the Impressionists and all the modern, exciting new ways of approaching art. So instead of each one of these Swedish artists going to Paris and making a name for themselves, 
they kind of hung out together in the little artist colony in the Grèze sur Luang. Um, this is a picture by Carl Larson, and it's uh, showing one of the other artist wives in that area. And this is Bruno Wiljefors. And while they were there, instead of working on their own fame, they decided to go back to Sweden. Sorry, this gets me every time. <laughs> and they changed everything. They went back. They put on an exhibition uh, from the banks of the Seine. Nobody had ever done a public exhibition before. It was always in the Royal Academy. Uh, they had a lock on it. You couldn't be an artist. You couldn't get commissions. You couldn't have your art bought until that point. So here we go. Public exhibition in Stockholm by the Artist League, the Konstnar Forbundet. Um, and they were immediately um, acclaimed. Pictures were bought from that exhibition, that public exhibition by the Swedish Museum that had just gotten started. And so they were on their way. They were a major public democratic artist league. Nothing to do with the royal, the royal aristocratic folks. Sanzane got to see Zorn's uh, exhibition paintings in the 1890s because uh, they, the artist league, started doing exhibitions every year, um, and. Anyone could participate, so there were hundreds of artists that actually joined the Artist League. And you can see here uh, Sanzane writing back to his dad, his pastor father, um, about how wonderful Zorn's paintings are. Uh, an unprecedented enthusiasm. Which brings us back to our hero. Joining Zorn's first studio class in October of 91, um, doo -doo. This is uh, one of the portraits that we've got at the gallery that he saved from his first month at this uh, Zorn studio because he, he wrote to his, his family and told all about how wonderful the color use that Zorn would do and Zorn only used a certain few colors, uh, you know, not a whole palette full. And you can see the similarities between uh, Sanzane's early effort and Zorn's methods. Um, Zorn taught by uh, showing. He would uh, take his brush and paint on students' canvases, and uh, Sanzane kept that method up, too, through his whole life. Uh, so in the next couple of years, Sanzane still worked with the artists of the Artist League, especially Zorn and Richard Beria as the, the oil painters. Um, you can see his plein air work out in those years. And this is a one piece that I just wanted to show. Um, Sanzane has, at this point, 1892, working with the Swedish National Romantics and their approach to art, modern art, which was to enjoy the landscape of Sweden around them and real people, real places. There are sketches we still have that Sanzane did where you can match up the sketches of real places that he walked to every day. So right here in this standing screen, you have, uh, you have the idea of arts and crafts, which is everything that surrounds you is, must be useful and beautiful for the, your, your surroundings. Whether you're a, a school student or a housewife, you should be surrounded by beautiful things, as Liz mentioned earlier. So arts and crafts, beauty in the home and surroundings. You've got a lot of um, the Asian influence at the time that was going around Europe. Sanzing loved Asian art more than anything. And so you can see the, the dynamics of that going on, like Japanese prints, picture in pictures. You've got the floral and the um, cropped diagonals, you know, just all kinds of very different than your traditional history painting of a 
you know, Roman emperor or what, what have you, or angels dancing around. Uh, real places, real things, real Swedish landscapes. So, um, Sanzain, being the young adventurer that he was, um, he read all about um, Mexican conquests, he read history, he read all about the world, and he wanted to get out and see it. And so, uh, 1894, he went to Paris um, on the advice of Zorn and Richard Berry and studied with Edmond Francois Amangeon in his studio in Paris. And lucky for us, the rest of those students are mostly Americans. So with Sanzane's um, language skills, uh, modern languages, he spoke German, French, Spanish, and English. So he became a real liaison with um, the American students, and he hung out with them at the American Club, translated for them, and um, they convinced him that he needed to come to America. And so he wrote to Bethany College's uh, president, who uh, actively recruited in uh, Sweden often. Uh, he wrote to the president and said, oh, could you use a, a young artist here at, in the middle of Kansas? And he wrote back and said, mm, sorry, no, we already have one. Uh, but we could use an instructor for modern languages and voice. You know, how are your tenor skills? Great, great. And <laughs> so off he went. That same year, September, starting the new semester, he arrived um, in Lindsborg. And this gives you uh, an idea of what Lindsborg looked like then. And imagine going from Europe to the middle of the United States, really at that time, you could only get places by train. And here's a, Lindsborg is a, a Swedish community. It was settled in 1869 by a, a whole um, congregation, you know, one picking up in, in Sweden and just coming full, everyone, <laughs> and farming. And so this is farm country. So he's bringing his art and culture and democratic approach to the middle of the prairie. Uh, and here's the school at that time. Uh, there was about 600 students coming from all over the place. And we have about 600, 700 students every year now. So it really hasn't changed all that much. Uh, one of the things about De Bethany College is its annual uh, Messiah Festival. Every Easter, they would perform um, from the late 1870s, I think it was 79 or 80, um, they started this annual tradition. And people would flock on the trains from all over the Midwest to hear the Messiah oratorio be performed. And you can see in this beautiful 1900 um, embroidered program, Sanzane is the tenor soloist there at the top, right? And um, having this festival right there, he was thinking, oh, what else can we do? So. He, in 1899, the year before that program, um, for the Messiah Festival, he got together with other artists that were uh, there in Lensburg, Carlo Tov and Malm, uh, and they thought, why don't we have an art exhibition while all these people are coming in to see and, and listen? Let's have uh, an art for people to look at. So like the night before, they came up with this last minute they put together this whole room. They borrowed things from all over the college to put together their exhibition, and they were so excited. And the first people, you know, arrived to the this, this school to hear the performance. But nobody really came except one, one old woman who didn't see very well because she was touching stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and Sanzane wrote a very entertaining account of this whole process. And they got together that night and said, well, well Nobody came to see our art. And they said, oh, 
well, maybe we better advertise. <laughs> so the next morning, they had flyers that they were handing out at the train station. And uh, as I said, you know, you, you couldn't throw them away. You'd get another one. <laughs> and so uh, from that moment, this very first Midwestern American uh, art exhibition got going. And this is the very beginning of the annual Midwest Art Exhibition that's still going on in Lindsborg today. We, we hold it at the gallery now. Um, and this became a model for other places like Chicago. Chicago had San Zane help them get annual exhibitions going. Um, 1905 they tried and then started again in uh, 1911. But um, the influences from this point onwards it just can't, can't be stressed enough. This is, this is where we get our art going, in Kansas, in the middle of the prairie, in the schools, everywhere. Uh, it's because San Zane and his compatriots are in constantly, every year, inviting all kinds of people um, to show their work in this uh, annual exhibition. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit and show you how the exhibition developed over time. The Swedish Pavilion was given after the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904. So it was used as the art department for many years in the Midwest. Art exhibition was shown there. Um, you can see San Zane would put his works, his students' works, but then he'd also invite um, Chicago artists to show. He'd invite Taos Society artists to show. He eventually, uh, you know, invited the regionalists, uh, Benton, Curry, and Wood, uh, out here. So there's San Zane um, helping people tour through. And I'm going to uh, skip up to 1911, as Liz did a, a wonderful job of, and I have a later superintendent that <laughs> it should be George Pinney there. Sorry. Um, but this is a program for the 1913 annual that developed in McPherson schools at the high school. And you can see the program. There's music, there's lectures, um, and more music, more lectures. And then that's how the school started uh, collecting through the fundraising of the um, entrance fees, as Liz explained. Um, and this, you know, every year the exhibitions got bigger. They, uh, other schools then, San Zane helped organize uh, traveling exhibitions of these school exhibitions. So it might start in McPherson, but then that show, some of them might go to Lindsborg High School, and they might go down to uh, Wichita schools, or they might go over to Clay Center, or Beloit, uh, just all over the state. So this is why you have amazing pieces of uh, original art in Little Soderstrom Elementary School. <laughs> and uh, Lindsborg High School, and Wichita Public Schools, collecting just amazing art. San Zane also wanted to collect for Bethany College in that same vein. So in 1913, he started the college's Smoky Hill Art Club um, to, uh, to promote arts and crafts. Um, but also to build up a good permanent art collection there and to popularize good art. And so dues were a dollar a year to join, and that, those monies were collected to buy art from the Midwest Art Exhibition, you know, other artists, especially prints, because they were much less expensive. Uh, San Zane followed his mentor Zorn and was a print collector as well as a printmaker. And so, uh, the school developed um, quite an amazing collection. Um, but sadly, uh, San Zane always wanted to have a Bethany College Museum for this art collection he was amassing. Uh, but that didn't really happen until he died. So that, he was constantly encouraging the collection of art by schools and starting of art centers. 
So his effect on his students, this is the main thing, this is his legacy. Uh, Anna Keener came to Bethany College to study with him in 1913, and you can see her. Um, there's uh, Anna Keener, there's Sanzane, and the rest of the art department and people in the Smoky Hill Art Club. Here's a glimpse of Anna Keener's work when she was with Sanzane, and she graduated Bethany 1918, um, and she enlisted for the end of the war, which was going on at this time too, and was sent to Michigan um, to do some work there. But then she came back to Bethany, was a student teacher for a year, and then she went to Arizona, um, and taught for a year, but then her parents said, oh, th this is the wilds, you have got to come home to Kansas. So uh, she came back and she started a, a teaching at the Kansas City, Kansas High School, which was the roots of what's now Wyandotte uh, High School over there in the Kansas City region. And sh this is where Anna really used what she saw because she would help um, organize the Midwest Art Exhibition at Bethany. She would, um, she took all the lessons that she saw Sanzane, and so she invited her mentor, Sanzane, to speak with her high school students. Um, and they actually had a whole big uh, advertised program where he spoke for the school and invited the whole school district to lecture on um, art collecting and um, starting their own collection. And so that Kansas City uh, High School did start their collection first with, uh, I believe, a couple Walter Ufer pieces that the kids decided to buy. And then they uh, pretty quickly bought the Canyon Wall here, 1922, a really large piece that hung in the high school and is. Uh, still out there in the school district and joined by a later Sanzane painting that they wanted to have pendants to hang above two fireplaces in a new school. Uh, so that continued in that school uh, by the efforts of Anna Keener, um, establishing an art collection in her high school and her district. And so this is the kind of thing that went on and this is how it happened. Now to add to that, effort. Um, in 1926, Sanzane came up with yet another program. And remember, he's still participating in all these annuals. He's organizing the Midwest Art Exhibition. He's assisting with the McPherson's uh, annual high school exhibition and then organizing um, exhibitions around the state and elsewhere. Um, but now, to go along with the Midwest Art Exhibition and the Messiah Festival, he decided to start uh, an art contest for kids, to get kids involved. And so grade schoolers uh, could win Sanzane prints for their classrooms, um, and then high schoolers could get a print, personal, personally signed, but then the top uh, two winners of an art contest could get scholarships to go to Bethany College. Uh, the top winner, the first prize would be a, whole, a year tuition, and uh, second prize would be you know, half tuition, a half year. Uh, so this was a recruiting tool. He was letting former students know um, that he was doing this. He sent this uh, brochure out, the little bulletin, to let them know, and uh, the art teachers in um, Concordia and Beloit and uh, Arc City and Winfield and all over the place sent their students' work in to this art contest. Um, and this a little out of place. I should have uh, started uh, 
with Sue Jean Hill Kovacevic. Um, she actually arrived in uh, at Bethany the year before of the, the um, art contest. She arrived there in uh, 1925 and studied with Sanzane for two years. And as you can see, she was involved in the Messiah singing. Uh, she was a Delta Phi Delta art fraternity that Sanzane had started, as well as a, a regular sorority. And um, her, her Daisy yearbook, of 1927 when she graduated was she can draw and paint most wonderfully well. And it, you heard uh, some about Sue Jean and her um, efforts and history. And uh, Sue Jean was one of those students who went on and helped establish um, art collections in Winfield schools uh, so that they have an enormous cultural treasure there in Winfield. Uh, Sue Jean spent most of the 30s in Mexico, um, producing all kinds of wonderful work. Here's a lovely picture of her coming back to visit in those years, uh, back to Lindsborg. The one picture where Sanzane is smiling, because he, <laughs> he smiled, but just not for pictures, apparently. And uh, she sent him back this, we hope you visit our home in Mexico City, and uh, Sanzane in 1935 took his daughter Margaret, and they did go visit Su Jean and her family there in Mexico City and produced wonderful works. And while there, uh, Sanzane got to see all the marvelous public murals in Mexico City. He uh, came back and wrote about those public efforts himself and done by the, the great such as Diego Rivera that Sue Jean is standing with and working on the idea of public art. Sanzane did three WPA Treasury Section um, Kansas Post Office murals himself and um, always was encouraging his students to um, add to the public access of art if they were teaching, if they were art collecting, whatever they did. And Sue Jean uh, went on to do the Winfield fabulous mural in the bank. Um, there you can see the um, finished whole huge wall and there's cutouts, kind of hard to tell it's so busy, but there's people and uh, walkways cut out through there. And Sue Jean there doing her public work. And now if we uh, skip back to the uh, art contest. Uh, Annie Lee Ross went to high school in Colorado Springs. She was under Pansy Dawes, who was a San Zane student in her former life. And so Pansy sent Annie Lee Ross's work, high school, over to the art contest. And uh, she got a scholarship. So she came over to Bethany College, um, very successful student there. She went on to teach in Concordia first, and then guess what she did there? She started an art collection. <laughs> and so now they, you know, they started with um, uh, less expensive works, uh, Sanzane Prince started the collection, and then they also had bought a watercolor for the schools. But Concordia wasn't one of those places that developed a big, huge art collection, unfortunately, unlike Winfield and Wichita and Lindsborg and uh, McPherson. But they still have those pieces, and it was important to them at the time. They were part of this um, art and culture movement that was just so prevalent in Kansas. Um, Annie Lee Ross came back and she uh, took over the Bethany Art Department when Sanzane retired in 1946. Um, so she also had a, a long teaching career out in Virginia before she came back. Another student who grew up in Great Bend, um, and he was a high school student in 1929, 
um, and he was sending uh, his work for the art contest every year. And Sanzane really paid attention to his work and they corresponded quite a bit. And uh, Charles Rogers won a scholarship. He was one of the top high school students. But unfortunately, um, 1929, you know, he graduated in 1930, boom, depression. He didn't actually get to go to Bethany College until 1938, uh, but he was a very uh, self-taught, self self-motivated uh, artist, and he built his own etching press out of like milk separator parts, um, and so he was uh, constantly sending work to, for Sanzane to um, show, and he participated in uh, Sanzane's Prairie Watercolor Painters group. Um, exhibition society um, and then he also uh, came back to teach when Sanzane retired um, he was the painting professor for several years at Bethany while Annie Lee Ross was uh, directing the whole department um, another student of that same time period Paul Kubitschek grew up in Salina, which is about, oh, 30 miles north of Lindsborg. And uh, he went to a Sacred Heart Catholic school for uh, his grade school years. And by the time he was in fifth grade, he was um, appearing in Sanzane's list of winning grade school and high schoolers for the Midwest Art Contest. And so he came to uh, Bethany eventually 1938 to 42, and uh, the recruiting worked. Um, so even before he went to Bethany, he was invited to be in San Zane's Prairie Watercolors group. And um, another student at that time, very important, uh, is Carl Peterson. Carl Peterson also attended Bethany uh, 1938 to 42, and there's Carl, there's San Zane, and here's a meeting in San Zane's studio of the uh, art fraternity. And uh, Carl Peterson grew up in the Lindsborg area, so his high school teacher was Elise Penner, one of San Zane's successful students, and um, so he was already in the fold. He didn't even need to win an art contest to be recruited to Bethany and study with Sanzane. Uh, so you can see some of his early work looking very much like Sanzane's. Um, but he went to teach, oops, wrong one, teach art, uh, first in Osborne, where he sponsored several art exhibitions that came from Lindsborg. Um, for his students, um, he was not successful in getting an art collection going in Osborne, um, so he wasn't there that long. But then he spent a lot of years teaching in the Salina School District. Um, there's a view of Salina's library, and you can see three prints up here, Benton Curry and Grant Wood, uh, two of which are in this exhibition borrowed from Salina's schools. So when Carl was the high school uh, teacher there in Salina, guess what he did? He started an art collection. And he was really thrilled that he could do that. He was really proud that he could bring in these known artists into the school building, as well as uh, teaching and really dynamic teacher. He would take his students on field trips to the Nelson and um, they would um, have parties and decorate and uh, just had a marvelous time. And so all those art students grew up and also did wonderful things. Um, but Carl Peterson um, was also then uh, invited Um, oh, back to Lindsborg. Sanzane died in 1954, and then it wasn't until 
1957 that the doors opened on the Barrier Sunzane Memorial Gallery there on the corner of campus land. It's not really under the college, but it's asso closely associated. So Carl uh, was invited in 1963 to take over directing duties of the gallery uh, and to let Sanzane's daughter and her husband, Pelham Greeno, have a bit of a break from directing and planning all the exhibitions and Midwest art exhibition and um, collecting for the college and the gallery. Um, so that gives you an idea of how this happened and the effect on school collections and the history that's so unique <laughs> that we still have fourth graders regularly doing their Kansas history projects on their artist. Thank you.